Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller and I am privileged each week to serve as your host and your interviewer. I'm also the author of a book series published by HarperCollins Leadership based on Franklin Covey's weekly podcast called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, followed by volume two, 30 more guests featured as mentors all drawn from the podcast, the first two books available at bookstores everywhere where I interview someone and then I realize, you know what, there really is a transformational insight, perhaps shared on the air, perhaps shared off the air, and with their permission, feature 30 in each of the 10 volumes over the next several years. Hope you'll pick up a copy of volumes one and volumes two. Today, our guest is a very special guest. I never use that term to describe our guest. Everybody, of course, has some level of uniqueness to add, but today I am honored to be in the presence of the oldest child of Sandra and Dr. Stephen R. Covey, of course, the co-founder of the Franklin Covey Company. She is the new co-author of the book titled Live Life in Crescendo. Your most important work is always ahead of you. Of course, her father, who is the co-author, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, passed 10 years ago, but Cynthia is launching this book as part of his legacy and is joining us today from her home here in Utah. Cynthia, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. I'm excited to be on your show. Delighted to have you here. Now, a bit of a rewind context. As I mentioned, the Franklin Covey Company was formed, gosh, about 20, almost seven years ago as a result of a merger between two companies, the Franklin Quest Company and the Covey Leadership Center. Both of those were founded by iconic authors and speakers and remarkable men, Hiram Smith on the Franklin Quest side and your father, Dr. Stephen R. Covey on the Covey Leadership side. They came together to form what is now the most trusted leadership firm in the world based here in Salt Lake City, where I had the privilege of serving as the chief marketing officer for over a decade. And of the many iconic books your father authored, including The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, including The Eighth Habit and Principle-Centered Leadership and First Things First and other books that collectively sold well over 50 million copies, although your father passed away just almost exactly 10 years ago, you carried with you his vision, his early manuscript for a book you two always intended to write, now that is just released, called Live Life in Crescendo. So Cynthia, take a few moments and reintroduce yourself to our listeners and viewers from around the world, and then we'll talk a little bit about the launch of the book, the content of the book, and what it means to live your life in Crescendo. Talk a little bit about your own history as a sibling, as a parent, as a, a leader, and now as a co-author of a new best-selling book, and then we'll dive into the book. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this this was a, a long time coming, but just to give a little background on myself, I am the oldest of nine children. I'm affectionately known as the mother hen. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment, although it means that the siblings have to pass everything through me. Of course, they're, you know, who their kids are dating and and what's going on in their lives. And I I love my I love my role. I love our siblings. We have a great relationship and our our family. But um yeah, I have I have six children of my own. Um I live in Salt Lake City. And my father and I began this journey, I think back in 2008, when um I asked him uh, mistakenly, I said to him, hey, are you ever going to do anything that will be as, as successful as Seven Habits? <laughs> and um, my, com my question um, kind of caught him off guard and almost insulted him. And he said, geez, you know, why do I get up every day? I've still got all these um, great ideas in my head and a lot of books to come. And um, this, is the, this is the reason why I'm, I'm getting up to write and teach. I've got my best work is still to come. And uh, that's kind of how it started. I asked him if um, we, we decided together that he, I would interview him and get some content from him on this topic. It was his personal mission statement, live life from crescendo for the last 10 years of his life. And so I had such a passion for it. And it meant so much to me looking at, at um, all the ages and stages of life I wanted to be involved. And so he asked me to do the stories and to kind of put it together and unfortunately, he passed away before it was completed. What a great story and journey. As you mentioned, you are the eldest of the nine 
Covey children. Your mother, of course, also passed recently as well. And so in some cases, you serve as the matriarch now of the family, of course, <laughs> with nine children. There are some of them yeah. who actually have an association with our company. Everyone knows your oldest brother, Stephen M. R. Covey. He was the leader of the Covey Leadership Center at the time of the merger. He's gone on to enormous impact and fame as an author and speaker. His book, of course, known to the world as The Speed of Trust, most recently relaunched a new book, called Trust and Inspire. You have another famous brother, Sean Covey, who happens to be the president of the education inter division at Franklin Covey. He wrote many books, including The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens and The Four Disciplines of Execution and other books that have had an enormous impact on not just the education arena, but also the business arena. One of your brothers, David Covey, was probably my most influential leader ever at Franklin Covey, shaped my life and my journey tremendously. Your course brother, youngest brother, Josh Covey, is in the firm as well. And you never, however, worked in the company formally. You now no. have the privilege of really carrying forward your father's legacy of effectiveness and mission principle-centered living. As the oldest of nine children, arguably you spent more time with your dad than perhaps anybody else other than your mom. <laughs> How would you describe your father's pinnacle of success? Obviously, when you were younger, your father was not a household name. And of course, when you were older, your father became an international celebrity, whether he wanted it or not. Was there a pivot point when you thought, you know what, my father, mission accomplished? <laughs> well, um, yeah, that there, there was, Scott. Um, you know, looking back on my childhood, uh, we were a, a normal family. We were, we loved each other, but we had normal ups and downs and struggles and problems like everyone else. But my parents, I felt like tried as hard as they could to live what they taught. And um, just thinking back on, on what you described as my father's pinnacle to us, um, the fame and things that he achieved in the business world and in speaking and writing was nothing to compare to that really paled in, in terms of how he was as a father. And just to use as an example, um, I talk in the book about when I was 12 years old, uh, um, that my dad invited me to go to San Francisco with him to accompany him on a trip. And um, I was so excited. Part of the fun was planning it two or three months ahead and talking about every detail. And the plan was that after his presentation, um, I would stand at the back of the room. He told me just to relax at the pool and enjoy the hotel and then come at the very end. And we would take off as soon as we could and go ride the trolley cars. For a 12-year-old thinking of being in San Francisco and these magical cars running all up and down the hills, I was so excited about that. And then we would um, go shop in some of the famous stores, the big department stores for school clothes, just, to, uh, just my dad and I. And then we would go, um, our next plan was to go get Chinese food in Chinatown, which we both loved. And um, then we'd race back, take a taxi back and swim before they closed the pool. Although my dad was legendary for swimming when the pool was closed, he had a good way of doing that, avoiding people telling him the pool was closed while they turned underwater, but we would have a nice swim in the pool and then come back and, and order room service, hot fudge Sunday. So it's, in a 12 year old girl's mind, this was the ideal trip. I was looking forward to it for so long and it finally came. It was all going according to plan. I was staying in the back of the room um, waiting for him and he came up to see me. And right before he got to me, one of his old college friends that he was really great friends with, but hadn't seen forever came up to him greeted him excitedly and invited him to come down, come uh, eat down at the wharf and have some seafood with he and his wife. And he explained that I was there, that it was a kind of a daddy daughter date. And, and uh, the, the, the friend said, Oh, she's welcome to join us as well. So as you can imagine, I panicked and could see my trolley car going down the hill without us and just thought, well, he probably would rather be with a, tw um, with his friend than a 12 year old all night anyway. So I was, um, when I was so discouraged and downhearted. And then I, I heard my dad say, hey, that sounds great, Bob. Um, I'd love to do that, but not tonight. Cynthia and I have a special night planned, don't we, honey? <laughs> they gave me a wink and grabbed my hand and we were out the door. And um, in a young girl's life, this was amazing. I just said to him, are, are you sure? Um, wouldn't you rather be with your friend? And he said, are you kidding? We've had this plan for months. Let's go catch a trolley car. And I know you'd much rather have Chinese food. Let's go. 
So anyway, that one experience was kind of indicative to me of my father's character and uh, what he valued, him, his um, books and, and ideas about putting first things th first and relationships, um, how important they are and your important roles. That spoke volumes to me and was kind of a, a great indicator in my life that my father was trying to live what he teach, what he taught. And I think the lessons I learned that night were applicable going forward in my life today. Cynthia, it's a very tender story, and I can tell that it's still kind of, you know, emotional for you. <laughs> There's not a parent anywhere in the world watching or listening to this podcast right now that's not thinking about when they're faced or have been faced with that same decision, what will they do? I can't help but think of my own three young sons and how many times perhaps I've diminished a what might have felt like an inconsequential commitment to them for something perhaps more expedient in the moment. But I appreciate the tenderness with which you told that story. Let's talk about the book itself. This book has been in the works for decades, and you have been shepherding this along in your father's absence with, I'm sure, the opinions of all eight of your siblings <laughs> and no doubt publishers and publicists and big shoes to fill. You don't try to fill your dad's shoes, but you do try to you know, uh, uh, walk in them a bit and, and carry forward his legacy. The book is just out called Live Life in Crescendo. It's your father's final work. Your most important work is always ahead of you. Let's build on that concept. What does it mean to have a crescendo mentality or a crescendo mindset? Well, um, the title of this book was conceived decades ago. And my dad told me, you got to fight for the title. They're not going to like it. They'll think it's too long. Do not get rid of the subtitle. Your most important work is always ahead of you. And it was true. I had to fight for it. But it, um, there's two parts to this book. And the first part is the crescendo mentality. That's um, He always spoke about putting on a pair of glasses, looking through a lens, a paradigm in a new way. And this book introduces the crescendo mentality, which is that the second part, your most important work is still ahead of you. Whether or not you are in a midlife struggle and you are feel stagnant in your in your work and feel like you know I haven't accomplished I haven't I haven't accomplished much I I thought it'd be further down the road I'm 55 I'm 60 and what have I done Am I really successful um, in a in a pinnacle of success stage where you, maybe you have been very successful and you've done a lot you've made a lot of money or you've you've achieved your goals What's next What's what's your most important work ahead of you um, and then in a, in a life change, life setbacks, you know, having facing a divorce, um, being laid off from work, a terrible disease, um, having your life crumble, you know, how are you going to react? What, what is, what, what's going to happen? How are you going to live? And then the last one is really why my dad uh, came up with this live life from crescendo was his personal mission statement. As I said, for the last 10 years, because I think he saw his mortality a little bit. People would come up to him and say, wow, Stephen, you know, you're 65, you're 68. How long are you going to do this? You're going to hang it up and retire? And our, in our word, the, the retire, the R word was not said in our home. <laughs> and he would and he felt like, why should I? I, I, have, I still have contributions to make. I still have passion for it. I still enjoy what I'm doing. And I, I want I have a message to share. And and so anyway, that's. Brief, briefly, uh, the book covers four different areas like that, but the main idea is that we can consciously choose to live in crescendo, which is a musical term, meaning it increases, music increases in volume and energy and power, or you can choose to live in dominiendo, which is when the music slows and it loses power and influence and eventually stops and comes to an end. So in the book, I'm trying. To, we're trying to show you have this choice to live in crescendo or dominiendo, to, and in any stage and age of your life, what are you going to choose? I think it's an important clarification. This isn't just a book for those who retired and their professional no. life is behind them. Now, what do you do in your 70s? It's really a book for right. anybody that needs an energy infusion, that's in an inflection point, an opportunity in their life that wants to live life in crescendo. I'm glad that you clarified that. To that point, there's a really vital, a big idea in the book that you and your father write about, and it's really around mending and restoring relationships. And without divulging any confidences or personal stories, is there a time when you saw your dad do just that? The iconic, you know, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, 
Was there a time when you saw him mend and restore a relationship? Um, you know, Scott, he was he was constantly doing that. You know, he you know, we all don't sometimes you don't uh, get along with everyone. Sometimes you have differences. Um, we all have have um, chances to do that. And he uh, um, one of his greatest qualities, I think, is that he could say he's sorry. He could start over. And there are many times when, um, you know, as a parent, you make a mistake and you uh, brush somebody off or you do something that that maybe you hadn't planned to do. And um, he he really he took the initiative many times to apologize and to say, you know, I, I lost my, I lost my temper. I'm thinking of a time when we all um, trying to get somewhere quickly and it was um, a, an important occasion to him and none of us really cared. <laughs> it took forever to gather and to get in the car and, to, and by the end, you know, it was, we, you know, he was upset and, you know, asking us to hur to hurry faster. And then pretty soon nobody really wanted to go. And the mood was ruined. It was an exciting um, honor or something that he was earning. And yet um, we felt, you know, we were fighting it. And I just remember him finally assessing the situation and thinking, this is, this, you know, this isn't so important. I, you, you, you all are the most important things to me. And I'm sorry if I've raised my voice and been upset with you. Let's just enjoy the night. Let's go together and, and enjoy being together. And he was really great at one-on-one -on -one dates. Like I said, the San Francisco story, all of my siblings could point to Sa San Francisco type experiences where he um, kind of made an effort to show that the little things in your relationship are truly the big things. Those are what matter to people. An another great uh, story about your father's humanity and um, humility. One of your dad's many quotable phrases is that humble leaders are more concerned with what is right than being right. And that's a statement that I've uh, revisited frequently as both a leader and as a parent. On this topic of mending and restoring relationships, you've obviously learned a lot from your father, an expert at this. Any tips you would give all of us that are probably facing this exact thing in our life where perhaps we have a relationship that needs a little bit of mending or restoring? Any ideas you would share with us that might get us going on that? Well, um... We're, we're, he always believed that no matter what you're doing, you're teaching and communicating something. And so um, the, the, big, the big tests in life are when you have trials, when you have setbacks, when you feel stagnant, when you are um, trying to figure out, you know, how can I reach this person? And um, this idea of the crescendo mentality applying to um, every stage of your life when you are struggling and maybe um, feel like I don't I don't connect with that person um, I don't have a relationship with them how can I how can I begin and I think just putting um, you know just starting you know how they we we talk about the uh, you put the big rocks into the into the bucket before the smaller ones you get the big things in spending time with people it, it was it was is the most meaningful um, you know the uh, the quality of time is always always more important than the quantity of time. I felt like um, my father was busier than most of my friends' fathers growing up, but yet I spent the most quality time with them because he planned ahead. Uh, that's another huge one is planning. Um, many times he would because he he was so busy he would have to plan events a, a year or two ahead, but he didn't miss our important events if we had a. a you know, a play we were in or something that was important to us, he would he would schedule around that. So I think it's important to um, not only put the time into the relationships, but to plan for them, plan, the, uh, you know, special dates together, plan one on ones, um, plan times that um, you can. I remember like going up on a ski lift with him once and just, you know, he would use um life experiences, like if I was going through some hardship with a friend or some guy I was dating, he would teach me things. Um, just take the moment, take that teaching moment right then to talk about, you know, it's all right to be um, vulnerable on the outside, to be soft and to be vulnerable. You can be hurt, um, but the, your core has got to be solid, your principles and your values and things that will never change. That's what's solid in the middle. But on the outside, you know, you are going to get hurt if you're if you're sensitive and and that's OK, because that's what makes you human. 
And so I, don't, I guess another one would be take those teaching moments that come uh, unexpectedly that you can apply life's lessons to wherever you are, up on a, going up on a ski lift um, at Sundance, talking about things that mattered um, in my life. Things like that stand out to me when I look back on, on our relationship. Cynthia, the book is full of great stories, funny stories, tender stories, relatable stories. One of your father's perhaps biggest legacies not to the world, but to this large Covey family is this iconic cabin that your mother and father left to the larger family up in Montana. And I've heard for 25 years as an associate in the firm, I see a lot of the social media pictures that your brothers and sisters post when the families gather there in the summertime and ski, of course, in the wintertime. And you wrote about it in the book about a particular story uh, about a gentleman named Chip Smith. And I wonder if you might take a few moments and tell us about the Chip Smith story and maybe why you chose to include that in this book. It's one of my favorite stories because it, um, it kind of reveals the character of my mom and dad to me and reminds me what I need to do in my life. But my parents were building this cabin um, years ago, probably 20 years ago. And um, it was the middle of winter and uh, Chip had some questions about the cabin that it were stalled that he really needed to have answered. And they, so um, we, we live in Salt Lake City and this was in Montana and my parents decided to travel up um, their busy schedule to, it takes about six hours or so to get there and travel all that way on icy roads and during the middle of winter to meet with Chip and discuss some important things for our cabin. Cynthia, remind but our it, listeners and viewers who Chip was. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Chip Smith was our was our family's builder. Thank he you. was building the cabin, and my parents had hired him, and um, he had, he he was stalled in some decisions he needed to make. So he, they needed to come up and meet with him, even though it was kind of a, a hard hard situation at being so cold and and um, middle of winter. So they traveled up, and then. Um, they could, they could sense that uh, something was deeply wrong with him. And they had heard that he was, he was having something wrong, going wrong with his marriage. And so uh, Chip you know, greeted them at the restaurant. The plan was to talk at a restaurant for a couple hours, and then they would go home uh, back to the hotel and then travel at five in the morning because my dad had to fly out the next day. And um, as they started, um, uh, my mom said to him, um, I, I understand that uh, you, you're going through a hard time in your marriage. And um, he said, you know, I'm actually getting divorced, told a little bit about it, but said, we're not here for that. That's fine. Let's let's move on. And uh, asking him some questions about the cabin and and two or three times, um, my mom and father interrupted him and said, Chip, you know what? Our, this isn't as important to us as our cabin's not as important to us as you're, you're right now. We can tell that you are are feeling so sad and we, we are here from you. We, we are your friends. We'd like to talk to you about it. Let's just let's put this on hold. And he said, needless to say, I broke down. We spent the next three hours talking about my personal problems. He was going through a, a terrible divorce and um was suffering so much that he um, that they they just spent the night talking with him and he he realized he he wrote us this experience after um, my father died and said um, he it is true that people uh, relationships are more important than things they had here they had this big decisions to make about their cabin it was very crucial but and they drove all this way during the um, on icy dangerous roads and had to leave first thing in the morning went home without even discussing the cabin but yet I could see what I meant to them and that in the darkest time of my life they were there for me and that meant the world for me so we received this letter after our father passed away and you can imagine what that meant to us um Scott that uh you know People are more important than things, and you have to show it sometimes during crucial times, even if it's hard. A superb reminder. The story is told really beautifully in the book. Uh, let's go back to this concept of living life in crescendo. Uh, yeah. From what you learned from your father and your mother and all your siblings that collaborated helping you pull the stories together, you as a co-author of this book, what are some tangible tips for people that are peaked, they're interested in living life in crescendo, not just because they've, you know, finished a 70-year career and now they're in their 80s or 90s, but yeah, perhaps they're my age. They're, you know, in their 50s or 60s and they see the second half of their life 
coming their way. Any profound concepts that you and your dad teach in the book that our listeners and viewers might benefit from today? Well, um, there, yes, Scott, there's, there's a lot of great ideas about um, living in crescendo when you have, you're facing life setbacks. Um, one of my father's greatest um, mentors was um, Victor Frankl and also Mandela, um, people that suffered greatly and had uh, such big setbacks, but yet here at 71, Mandela's released from prison and you would think, um, my, my dad studied him realizing, you know, most people would think that um, his life would be over. He's 71. He spent 27 years um, on Robins, Robins Island in South Africa. He comes out right when um, he's released and they, he, you're thinking his life is, is finished. He's, he's kind of been living in Dominiendo. And yet um, he, he realizes I still have important work ahead of me. Who would think at that age and after what he had suffered that he would take that experience and go on to help put a put aside apartheid and apartheid with de Klerk. Four years later, he is um, made the president of South Africa, the first black president ever. And and President de Klerk is his vice president, um, humble enough to take that position. And yet and then he goes on and changes the world. So the idea of. Um, you know, your circle of influence. My father's always talked throughout his books about your circle of influence. May You may think it's small. It may be just able to affect a few. But if you can enlarge it like uh, Mandela did or like Viktor Frankl taking a horrible situation where he was imprisoned in a concentration camp and then eventually becomes the father of logotherapy and, it, and it's a domino effect. His, their circle of influence grows and gr grows and grows until it it actually takes over, you know, can spread through the entire world. So that's one idea of um, realizing where you are if you're facing a, a life setback. If you are stagnant in a business situation, maybe you, um, were, you've you given some ideas to your boss and been shut down, you know, some ways to improve. And maybe you're not um, feel fully appreciated or feel like your skills are being used at all um, in, in the job that you have and you're, you're underpaid and underappreciated. And so what do you do? A life in Dominiendo um, would just think, you know what, I'm gonna bide my time and get by. I'm gonna take my paycheck. I'm not gonna do anything extra. I'm not gonna add value um, to, to the company. I'm just going to go day by day. But the same person could, could take that opportunity of, of being stagnant and realize I still have choices. I still can influence those around me. I can increase my circle of influence. I can take responsibility for myself. I can change my, my surroundings. And eventually that pays off. His, his life would begin to expand as he still contributes um, more, even if he doesn't feel like it's appreciated. He reaches out to other colleagues and they get excited about a project and they do a little extra. And then pretty soon that grows and expands and, and that person's life has changed. He's out of a stagnant midlife. Cynthia, last thought. The, the, your final tribute to your father and to your mother was quite moving in the book. And you share some things that perhaps weren't commonly known about your dad. Would you revisit a couple of those for those people that are listening that have obviously been a follower of your father's and read his books and been to his workshops and perhaps they've even changed the trajectory of their careers or their marriages or their lives. Talk about perhaps some of the things you share in the book about your dad that uh, other people may not know about. Yes, um, I appreciate that opportunity because as a family, we decided that this was important to show um, you know, we're, we're our journey in living, trying to live in crescendo, which, which, you know, it can be, it can be easy in, in times that everything is going well, but it can be very difficult facing trials. And, um, we, we faced, we're trying to live in crescendo ourselves. I, I living in crescendo to finish this book. I'm mm -hmm. 65 years old and it's taken me 10 years and I didn't know if it would be published. I didn't know if it would, you know, everything would come about. And I, I had to live in crescendo myself trying to be a faithful translator of my dad's last big idea to get this out. But back to this, um, the, the part of the end of the book where we have, I have spoken more personally, uh, our family faced three huge trials 
that we had to decide, are we going to live in uh, crescendo? Are we going to have this mentality that we still have important things ahead to contribute? Are we going to unite? Uh, my mom had um, back surgery. Um, she'd always been healthy. And all of a sudden she has back surgery and it goes wrong. And she's in the hospital for four months and um, t totally a changed person. She's Everything's consumed with her health problems and comes home in a wheelchair. And at the same time, we noticed that our father is not um, kind of not the same, not responding to, to our mother and the doctors as we think he would. He is a high energy person and it takes a lot of initiative and would want to get to the bottom of things. And he wasn't acting like that while she was in the hospital. And we noticed some, some changes and um, in his personality, um, he became more apathetic and this is not, this was not like him. And all of a sudden we, after being diagnosed, um, he is diagnosed with front temporal dementia. Um, uh, you know, you're supposed to, if you use your, your brain, you won't lose it, but you know what this, he was physically active and, and, and mentally alert. And um, this happened to him. It's only 4% of the people that have uh, dementia have front temporal. And so our family um, together, we're watching our mom who's in a wheelchair and is different and can't do much. And our father is diagnosed with dementia and is not able to work anymore in his, in his, his greatest mission and his, his life um, uh, profession of teaching and writing. And um, we, that was a hard time for us. And as siblings, we had to um, pull together and rely on each other and our faith and our belief that, you know, we can still have great things come of this and we're going to do what we can to see this through and support our parents in their, in what we perceived as a great decline. And um, eventually my father, um, my mom, my mom recovered. My mom uh, really fought to live in crescendo and, and she still was still in a wheelchair, despite her wheelchair, she still was the matriarch of the family and planned the activities and wanted to come to our games and, and do all the things that we did together to bring us together. And then our father who had um, dementia, we rallied and, and supported him and spent as much time as we could and tried to make his, his life wonderful. Um, he was biking one day um, on, a, on an electric bike and, and lost control. And um, he was with somebody, but he hit his head and he started having internal bleeding. And that ultimately took his life about three or four months later. And um, it was a blessing um, in the long run because uh, he wasn't the same. And uh, But this was hard for us. We both had parents. We felt like we didn't have either parent for a time. And then a couple months later, uh, my brother Sean's uh, beautiful daughter, Rachel, at 21, passed away from effects of depression and um, just a, two months after our father left. And uh, this this rocked our family, too. We had three hard things in a row within a couple of years and very close to each other to uh, together. And we we rallied and decided, um, you know, as a family, as Sean said, uh, someone told him that you'll always have a hole in your heart from uh, losing Rachel. And that kind of bothered him. And he thought, you know, instead of a, a hole, I'm going to grow a muscle there. And so he um, their family, all of us rallied around them and they are remarkable. And they decided to make something um, to contribute to others lives out of because of in Rachel's behalf. And they began Bridal Up Hope, which is an amazing um, uh, nonprofit that they run in Alpine for um girls from 12 to 18 and also some women that suffer from anxiety and depression and from trauma from abuse and they run this in her name and they use equestrian training which is very healing for people as well as the seven habits for teens to um to help these girls in in um, these classes to graduate in 14 weeks from this and it's life changing. Ninety three percent of the people who have gone through the parents have said it was life changing for their daughter. And so um, I know I've said too, I've talked too long, but I'm just our personal examples is um, this is a lifetime effort. The crescendo mentality is something that can apply through all ages and stages of life. And we've had to we practice it ourselves. We struggle as, as long along with everyone else. But we keep coming back instead of looking in the rearview mirror, as my father would say, don't look in the rearview mirror, look ahead. You're driving a car. And if you look in the rearview mirror, you're going to go in a ditch. But if you keep looking ahead at what's coming and what you have to contribute and what's ahead, you can still have a wonderful life despite life setbacks. 
Cynthia, you are a class act and a beautiful ambassador for your father's legacy and life's work. This book is the final book by the internationally acclaimed author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen R. Covey and you, his co-author, Cynthia Covey, Covey Holler. The book is Live Life in Crescendo. Your most important work is always ahead of you. Cynthia, thank you for joining us today on Leadership. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. I appreciate talking with you. My pleasure. And we'll see you back here for a new interview next week on Leadership. Mm -hmm.